I am from Bloomsbury Publishing. We're really delighted to be publishing Tim's book on the trail of Genghis Khan a bit later this year. Thanks to Google, who've supplied some extraordinary technology, we are joined by Tim Cope today and some school children from Caulfield Grammar School in Melbourne. Um, and they are going to show us some amazing things in Mongolia. So welcome, Tim. And before we get started, where are you? Yeah. Uh, well, we're in the what's called the Harkira High Pass in Western Mongolia, so we're at about 3,000 metres, uh, and I'll just give you a little view of our surroundings. I don't know if you can see the um, see the big mountains back there. Um, we've been trekking for about how many? How far is it now? Four days. We've been trekking for about four days. Uh, we've got a group of about ten Mongolians, or maybe nine Mongolians. Um, most importantly, here I'll just quickly. Introduce you to Seren, and Seren, um, we've been doing trips together for about five years, four or five years, and um, uh, I've I've known Seren for about thirteen years, and she's the one who helped me when I first uh, came here on the horse back in two thousand and four, and she introduced me to another. Well, to say hello, Seren. Yeah, hello, hello, everybody. Yeah. Uh, and Sarah will be able to translate for us today uh, if any of your questions. Um, most importantly, over here, we've got um, Dashnyam and Hogshin. So you can say hello. <laughs> and um, I've, I've known, uh, this is Dashnyam uh, over here. <laughs> and I've known Dashnyam for about well, nine years, and we've been doing trips together for a while and uh, he's the one who originally took me over the Harkira Pass on my journey from Mongolia to Hungary. And there's a few other uh, Mongolian staff we have at the back, so raise your hands from Mongolia. Yeah. And the young, I can show you our youngest, uh, our youngest trekker. Can you see Altai there? <laughs> and um, Altai is about seven years old, six years old, almost seven. So he's been doing a bit of horse riding, um, a bit of piggybacking on the Caulfield students, and and, and quite a lot of walking as well. Um, over here we also have uh, Claire Walter, Claire Wave, and Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Claire, Claire is uh, the teacher who's taken on, on herself to bring all of these students to Mongolia, um, and they're very lucky to have her at the school. Uh, and I'll just point out before we go on two other important people, if it's okay. We've got uh, we've chosen two people from Caulfield Grammar to answer questions on behalf of the students. So we've got Matthew, Matthew Hogan. And uh, where's Claud Claudia? Here's Claudia. So uh, we're set to go. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's let's get some questions then. Um, Carolina, do you have a question for Tim and, the, and everyone in Mongolia? Uh, yes. Uh, I want to know how's the food there. How's the food? <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll hand it over to the to the uh, the students. To start with um, start with Claudia. Um, I think it's pretty fair to say that so far the food's definitely been interesting and a little bit different to what we're all used to. Um, we've all tried some dried curd in the girls that we've been to, which is a bit different, <laughs> um, but it's really nice. Yeah. yeah and what about uh, meat and things? No, How have we got our we've, food? We've had various meats. We've had. <laughs> we've, uh, what have we had? We've had a bit of goat, a bit of uh, sheep, lamb. lamb. The we don't know. Yeah. I'm quite sure. Yeah. Some of the food that we've eaten, we're not 100% sure what it is. And what about <laughs> catching our, our dinner? Oh, yeah. Last night we um, we went down to one of the local girls and we. We picked a sheep and we, we killed it and then ate it for dinner that night in a nice in a nice stew. So that was good. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so really adapting to the culture, I would thought. But no, we, we've um, it's been a real a real journey. I think everyone would agree with that. We we couldn't do our normal route because the river was flooded, so we had to do a detour for one extra day. And we've been visiting a lot of nomadic people, uh, going into their homes. We've tried, uh, as Claudia mentioned, we've tried um, dried curd, and we've seen the meat drying in the gurs, what's known as borts. Uh, they've tried yogurts and cheeses, and and they watch the traditional way that the that, that sheep and goats are slaughtered in Mongolia, which is very interesting in, in its own self. Uh, and, and yeah, salty tea they just mentioned. Um, it's very interesting the way they slaughter the sheep because they they make a slice down the chest, and they reach the hand in and they actually break the aorta, uh, and that's to keep any blood from spilling out of the body onto the ground. Um, partly anyway, because traditionally um, it's kind of sacrilege to let blood spill onto the earth. So in other countries, uh, they might um, slaughter a goat by, by cutting its throat. Uh, it's quite different here. Um, Tyrion, maybe you've got something you could add about the food. We've been eating a lot of great food as well. That Tyrion's been. Uh, something about traditional Mongolia. Should we go to the next question? Yeah. Yeah, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Edward, have you got a question for Tim? Uh, not really. Um, what advice would you give to as aspiring adventurers? Um, I think the most important thing is to realise that that you don't have to be a, a super athlete or have any special amazing super qualities. Um, you just have to want to do it and have the, the passion to do it. It's also not very expensive to have an adventure and it just start in small steps. Someone said, so I heard a guy asked once, he said, someone asked him, he said, how do you become a mountaineer, you know, what course do you do or what uni degree should I do? And he told him, he said, you have to go and climb a lot of mountains. And if you've got, you're passionate about something, you just have to somehow take the initiative and take small steps um, and when opportunities come along, grab them. But um, yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's what you're passionate about, I think if you follow it and you do it, um, anyone can, can do it. I mean, I think I'm pr proof of that because I'm certainly... Uh, don't feel like I've got any any superhuman qualities at all. Um, just just yeah, I think I'm lucky that I was able to do something I love doing and um, um, yeah, a lot of hard work and following your heart's very important as well. So yeah, cool. Thanks, Tim. I will take a question from Carl. Thank you. Carl, have you got a have you got a question? Oh, Carl, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, unmute yourself? I'll come back to you in a minute, perhaps. Steve, have you got a question for Tim? Um, I, I actually didn't realise this was a live hangout that I'd be in it, but sure, i got a question for Tim. Hey, Tim, how you doing? I'm good, yeah. How are you, Steve? Yeah, man, very well. Um, I remember back in the day when you first came home and you, you, you'd written your whole story and, uh, and I caught up with you and someone had actually stolen the... The original story that you'd written from your four-year journey out of the back of your brother's car, and now four years later you've finally finished that. That's a pretty epic journey for you to have to relive that experience on paper and, and retell that story. How was that experience for you? Was it? Did you feel you were uh, the book is better for it? That four years of reflection. Um, yeah, I mean, what you're referring to was was really traumatic. I'd spent obviously three and a half years on a horse. Uh, crossing Eurasia to Hungary and cradling my diaries and my, um, my my film cassettes and everything and sending them back by, by DHL and I was in Australia uh, doing some film work and yeah anyway a bag with some diaries was stolen and I didn't lose all I lost a, a portion of my diaries from my trip and it was really it felt like someone had stolen my life um, at the time but in the last four years I've been focusing on writing and I was lucky to have a lot of the important diaries remaining 
but I've relived the experience and the the, the, the writing itself has been probably uh, even more challenging than 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 the journey itself in many ways. Um, my editor's been fantastic, really thrown down the gauntlet for me to to write in a way that I've never written before, um, and all the ups and downs. But uh, I couldn't say whether the book's better or worse because of those diaries. I'd suggest it's probably about equal to what it ever would have been. I remembered, f and I had far too much material, so the book was about was over a thousand pages in the first draft, and we've cut it down by around about half over five or six drafts. So um, yeah, my issue was that. I certainly remembered uh, remembered too much, if you like, and it was a matter of boiling it down to those really important experiences. So, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Steve. Oh, that's cool, man. I can't wait to read it. I'm very excited to read it. Okay, I'm going to go to to Tim and the big group of people with Tim. Tim, have you got a question there? Yeah, I'm just taking you off uh, mute now. Um, yeah, question for Tim. Um, what is it about Mongolia that keeps drawing you back? Oh, I think what I mean, watching the reactions from these students, I feel like I'm I'm watching myself from about you know 13 years ago when I first came here. Um, it's just unless you've been here, it is hard to, to to really understand. But it's a place where there are no fences, there's no private property. It feels as if you can just go anywhere. There's nothing that's inaccessible. You can climb any mountain. You can essentially get a compass bearing and, and go there. The people live within the means of their environment. They don't try to dominate it. They live in a very harsh environment, and they're so welcoming. I mean, when you when you arrive, they um, make you feel very much at home, and. I think it's unique in the modern world that, that people can still live like this. Um, I mean, across the border in Russia, China, Kazakhstan, they're places with a similar heritage, but uh, things have changed there during the colonisation period, which means that it hasn't got that same spirit like, like here. I think um, it's kind of a miracle the way that Mongolia does exist, uh, but it's mostly for the people, I think. That, that I keep coming back and, and bringing the people here. Would you agree, guys? Yeah. 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 Maybe I'll actually, if, if it's okay, Louise, I might go to Claudia and Matt because I think it's really interesting to hear, um, you know, what their impressions are because they're really, you know, here for the first time and their impressions are probably a bit fresher than mine even. Matt. Oh. First impressions of Mongolia. I guess it's it's interesting because all the Mongolians they can be six or eight or even, you know, higher than eight people in a family and they all squeeze into a gur about I don't know, five metres in diameter, a circular shape. And they're all so so welcoming and um, humble and offering us our food and uh, tea and everything whilst they don't have very much. They're extremely giving in what they do have, and especially in their time. I mean, it's testament to see the guys that are here today with us, um, you know, helping us through our journey and bringing all their animals along to help us as well. So I think that's first impressions of Mongolia, very giving people and wonderful landscape, um, beautiful hills. There's nothing that compares in Australia to what it's like here. Like, We've got we've got rivers down to one side down there, and then we've got snow-capped mountains up to the other side. There's just spectacular. We're we're trying to teach one of the guides how to say it because he didn't know view or spectacular or anything like that. And the views from where we are sitting right now are just spectacular, breathtaking. Just yeah, nothing compares. Tim, show us show us where the show us the mountains again. Okay, so I'll just stand up. Um, I'll, I'll have you know that we've actually uh, trekked especially up here this afternoon for you. Um, our camp is about an hour's walk down there. Um, so that this mountain over here is is uh, Harkirau, which is about 4,000 metres, just over 4,000 metres. And if we go around here, 
go to the other side, you can't see quite as well, uh, but there's a mountain there called Turgunu, which is also above 4,000 metres. And tomorrow we're going to walk over this pass and we're going to climb uh, up those, the, the, we'll be up on the top of that ridge that you can see over there. So we'll have, um, that's going to be our toughest day, getting up to that ridge, which is at about 3,000, about 3,700 metres. Um, yeah, it's uh, probably my favourite place. That's where we are here. And this is the, you can get, get a better, if there's any parents here, uh, here's your chance. <laughs> I think we've got yeah, at they're, least they're all in one piece. three. I think we've got three families dialed in, dialed in tonight, um, which is really fantastic. Um, do you mind if I take another question, Tim? I'd like to take a, t a no, question no worries. from Carl. Carl, is, are you ready to go? Oh, no sound. Do you know what you can do? You can type me a question in the chat box. Um, Michael, would you like to ask a question? Sure, Tim. Um, I really, really want to know because there's one trip that I want to do, which is from Saigon to London, and some of the area that you're in is part of my trip. So, so what prep do you think I need to do for that? Oh, by by truck, of course. So, what sort of prep do you think I need to look for that? Are you taking your own car? Did you say, or I'll by, take truck, a truck, by foot, yeah. or what, what? What? What did you say? No, I'll take it by truck. So, Great there's truck. a new road that they've opened up. Um, through to Pakistan, through China, which is really, really interesting stuff. So I just wonder what your thoughts were. Right. Uh, take a photo album from home. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing. That's yep. the icebreaker I found is probably the best thing to be able to show people. And getting people on side is the most important thing on any trip because inevitably your truck's going to break down and you're going to have all kinds of problems even if you plan really well so um, learning to have good relationships with the local people I think is the key to mm -hmm. your trip um, apart from that I don't know much about uh, <laughs> don't know much about trucks but but um, yeah I think if you if you just use common sense and try to find good people um, go into it with an open mind um, don't expect the borders to be very easy. Uh, the bureaucracy on borders can be really tough, but you just have to stick it out, and you'll find a way a way through. Um, yeah, I mean, every journey is different. It's very hard to say, but as long as you you set out with an open mind and you've done as much prep as you can um, with your equipment and you've thought about all those kind of things I just mentioned, I think you'll be, you'll make it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps. I'm probably not. not yeah, it is. Deal, very but... helpful. Very helpful. Tim, Tim, I've got a couple of questions here from people that yeah. um, have posted questions. I hope you don't mind if I ask. Um, this is a question from Sarah Stevenson and she, she asks, what is the secret to staying happy upon return home after such a trek? It must be hard to come off such a buzz of the excitement of travel. Uh, I think, um, well, it is inevitably difficult, but the the thing is, for for me now these days, is I, I'm I'm very used to going back and forth, and the key is to find out what the advantages of that place where you're in. So there's many great things about living in in any country, and they they tend to come more to your forefront of your mind when you're in it when when you're in a different country so in Mongolia for example um, you know I, I love the fen the no fences and the freedom and I miss that a lot when I'm in Australia uh, but there are other things in Australia that that I miss when I'm here to a, to a degree so uh, that's that's uh, that's the key I think just to to work out what it is that you like about wherever you are and and focus on that don't focus on the negative and, and try to be Happy in that way, and always have a, always have something on your horizon. You know, I think, I think um, I'd probably be unhappy if I didn't have some kind of dream or goal, somewhere, you know, hanging around somewhere on the distant horizon, no matter how far away that was. I think that gives you uh, optimism and hope, and um, 
yeah, allows you to be happier when you come home from trips because you realise it's not not your last ever trip. It's um, just the beginning of something else. Yeah. I've got another great question here from Patricia Rodriguez, and she asks, "How do the peoples of Mongolia see you and your life, and how do you see their life? Um, what are the things that impact? What's the impact you have on each other?" Um, I think, I mean, the most important thing about meeting people, especially Dashnyam and Hogshin over here, is is the sense of friendship. Um, you know, like that that's what I've taken away from my my journeys. It's kind of irrelevant what culture we may or may not be from. Uh, we could especially in these kind of journeys, it's you know, on my original horse trek, turning up in a turning up in a in a gur hungry and cold and dirty and in disrepair and you just meet a total stranger who takes you in, helps you and there's just a com camaraderie almost that develops in that moment that never goes away and they appreciate it and you appreciate it and the the key to traveling in, in Mongolia and anywhere on the steppe is that when you go home um, you don't forget the people that you met and you try as best you can to retain uh, a sense of friendship um, whether that be coming back and revisiting like I do or or sending things or whatever it might be. Um, but that would be a good question for me, Sarah. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Sarah, I was going to ask you to translate for Hogshin and, uh, and Dashnav. Sarah is hiding here. She's she's not feeling very well today. But, um, okay, I've, I've actually got a question. <laughs> I've got a question here from um, uh, one of the... She looks, oh, Sorry, Tim. I've got a question here from one of the parents yeah. whose webcam is not working, and she wants to know. She says, "Could you please ask the kids what's been the most challenging part of the journey and what's been the highlight?" So that's for the kids from Caulfield. That's for the kids, okay? Yeah. Yay! <laughs> what's been the most challenging and what's been the most exciting? Claudia? Um, I think that it's pretty... Yeah, hello, hi. Um, <laughs> I think that it's pretty fair to say that it's been um, very different for each of us. I think everyone's had their own personal experience and their own personal challenges and highlight. I think for me, um, some of the things that have been most challenging but also most rewarding is the trekking. Like, getting up here today to talk to everyone was pretty hard. <laughs> But at the same time, look at where we are. Like the view's amazing, and it's so spectacular. Um, so I think that another highlight for me, as well, has been getting to know everyone so well, and getting to know the Mongolian people so well as well. Mm. Um, and just quickly, Matt, we'll go on to Hogshin and. Um... <laughs> I reckon probably the hardest thing for me uh, at the moment right now is probably the cold. It's it's not very warm at the moment. I think if I hazard a guess, it would be, I don't know, maybe five or lower degrees. And um, it's been hard to sort of adapt from coming from uh, cold Melbourne but coming to even colder Mongolia and sort of, I don't know, sort of the highlight of my journey has been going into the really warm gers and sitting down and having hot tea and appreciating how all the Mongolians live and all of that. So probably... What's a girl, Matt? Like a Mongolian house, the house that they all live in. It's a tiny little... Felt tent. It's a yeah. tent. Felt tent, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably it. <laughs> um, Louise, just quick, can I quickly go over... I'd really like um, Sarah to ask Hogshin and... Ashnyam some questions. Can come no, we've got about five yeah. minutes to go, or five, five ten, ten minutes to go. Okay. Okay, well, I, I just to yeah. <laughs> we just want to. I just wanted to ask them, um, for your benefit, what what their impressions are of um, of me coming back over the years, but also what what the friendship means, but also what it's what their impressions are of the group. <laughs> Uh, 
you know, sky is blessing us so much, extremely. We have such a good weather, <laughs> did we? <laughs> and that's what he's saying. So we have um, no rain, so it's uh, good. So we are really excited, also happy to have uh, Australian children here. And we're also always grateful to see uh, Tim Cook back here in our home. Yeah. yeah. And quickly, Dashna, something yeah, about... Yeah. Can talk loud. Talk. Ah, viewers also so we have really good summer this year and we have good grass that's very important for us and uh, yeah also for my for my company I'm already working more than 10 years I have been uh, making journey with Tim already nine years ago so we know each other it's uh, Good to see him every year back, and also good to see Australian children with us here. Yeah. Yeah. Children, how is it And, and um, Dush, I don't know if you could hear all that, but Dush Nyam, he has seven, well, yeah, eight children. Seven, no, uh, seven, seven children. He has seven children and one grandchild, and they all, most of them live in one tent. Um, all of them. All of them, actually. <laughs> In the one girl, so yeah, he's a, become like an old friend, and it's really special to come back here every year. So yeah, I'd just like to um Over take to you, one, one more question. Um, Louise, hello. You've been trying to join us this whole hangout, so welcome. Do you have a question for Tim and the kids? Oh no, we can't hear you. <laughs> She just needs to unmute. I think she's on a tablet, so she just needs to uh, unmute. I can work now. It's okay. Yay! Can you hear have, me? You got a <laughs> yeah, have you got a question, Louise? Oh, okay. We're just wondering how Ella was going. <laughs> How's Ella then? Ella. Where's Ella? <laughs> Where's Ella? Oh, there she is. <laughs> no tears. Ella, so hi. <laughs> it's taken us 40 minutes to get on here. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. Oh, that's amazing. These are my friends. Are you good? <laughs> okay. I think we've got one more time for one more question. Has anyone got a question about Mongolia for Tim? Just wave. Okay, over here, Tim and family, have you got a question? I have a, a, a question for Tim about the plans for the community project, whether the students have actually thought about how the money will be spent. Yeah, we've, um, that's something that we, we haven't mentioned in this Hangout and we should have. Um, Louise, the, the students have spent the last six to 12 months... Uh, oh, this is this Connie's mum, by the way. This is, here's Connie just here. <laughs> Fundraising money. They've done an extremely uh, amazing job. They've they've exceeded everyone's expectations. They've raised in excess of, of twenty thousand dollars. I won't go into details of how much exactly. Is that the twenty seven? Oh. 27 money yeah. still coming. So it's an amazing amount of money they've raised and at the end of this trek we're spending three days at the community 
in right. Hoved where we'll be uh, doing a community project. A lot of the decisions about the funding will actually be made when we get there. In terms of, uh, we're going to decide, help decide as a group um, how we're going to overcome some pretty difficult logistics and basically we're, we're trying to repair and fit out a dormitory for a school in Hoft. Uh, it's a dormitory that caters for nomadic children. Um, Sarah knows a bit more about the community, what we're going to be doing hands on. Maybe you could quickly say something, Sarah, about what we're going to be doing there. Uh, yeah. Actually, hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, this dormitory has 180 students from, uh, from the different parts of the, the village. And uh, the main uh, aim was two years ago is just to. Uh, this dormitory has uh, no cupboards, have they say, mm -hmm. no tables, no chairs. So when we saw with the teacher Claire and also Tim Cell, we have we thought that we it will be really good. It could really um, uh, help uh, with it, you know, because um, everyone need own little space and own uh, own cupboard. So that's been. Um, uh, so we will do. Uh, we will make that part, but also from school side, we had also request. If we could uh, make some shelters outside of the dormitory, just to make it a little uh, nicer uh, uh, looking environment, is a good word. Some gardening and some, and some gardening. So, and... so we are also spending on that. So, lots of uh, final decision we will make it there because um, uh, it has to be also the, uh, from the students side also has to be. Um, their opinion, opinion and student, Mongolian students' opinion is also important. So I'm not here every year. Now I am here every year, but uh, you know, once in a year I cannot check and control everything. So uh, yeah. it's been a little bit delayed also from our side. So we will um, we have made decision in certain things, but lots of decisions will be making on the spot yeah. on the yeah. last three days after actually. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think. Um. <laughs> There's lots more details, but yeah, yeah. I think we're probably going to have to wrap up now. Oh, I've just got to say, Matthew's family says hi. They've been posting, and there's um, hello to Matthew. They're very. I think everyone's very excited to see you. So, Tim, yeah. I, I would I'd really last ask for just one one last sort of message from you, really. Okay. Well, well first of all, I think everyone should say. Say hi and bye. Hi, bye. <laughs> and um, we're having a a really special trip here in Mongolia. I'll just give you another quick panorama of uh, of where we are. In fact, our camp is way down there. You may or may not be able to see it. <laughs> Pick it out. Um, but yeah, Mongolia is a extraordinary place, and I think we're all feeling very lucky to be here and, and pretty pr very privileged to be with such great people. Uh, you've met on this hangout Dashnyam and Hogshin and Seren and I think, oh, oh Sagana, Sagana, quick, come here, quick, 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 quick. Very quickly, Louise, this is the, this is uh, Sagana, he's how about the 20, 22, and Sagana is Dashnyam's son. He's been learning English and um, he's becoming a great guide. So, uh, anyway, very quickly, it's all about the um, the people and the relationships that we have here. And thanks to them, we're having this this great experience. And everyone, read my book when it comes out. It took me, <laughs> <laughs> it took me four years to write, and this is kind of a celebration for me. I haven't even mentioned this to the kids, but this is a special trip for me because um, it's like celebration for finishing it so um, yeah thank you got, all for, for joining yeah I've got one last request I was wondering we were having a joke before we really started do you think you could pan around to all the kids and could all the kids and all the Mongolians shout out spectacular 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 <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you. Right, well, I think that's all from us. We've got to get back down. We've got to get back down to camp, and uh, before, well, 
it doesn't get dark till late, but <laughs> um, yeah, everyone's hungry, so we've got to keep the students happy. <laughs> well, thank you, yeah. and thanks for everyone taking part. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah.